Minnesota Stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be your Chickasaw native, your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And what a treat we got today. My favorite family in wrestling history. It's one of the greatest families in wrestling history. I've never seen one of them that couldn't work. And I've been in the <laughs> ring with nearly all of them. They are all great people. And this one especially had some crazy moments in WWE. We were together in Crockett in Texas. But as a, as a Guerrero, always one of the greatest workers of all time and one of the best guys of all time. He is Mr. Hector Guerrero. Hector, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on, guys. It's just a privilege just to be with you two guys. You guys are like, uh, you guys are where you're by family. So I want to I wanna say it's it's always great to see. Gerald, you're like a, you're much a mentor to me in my, my youth. And uh, John, well, we were like, Buddy, buddy, buddies for that time that we were together. I, and with Eddie, you know, you were always there. So, you know, always there. Thank you, brother. Oh, I had so much fun with Eddie. Wait a, wait a minute. Wait a, wait a, wait a minute. Mentor what? you in your youth. What the hell now? <laughs> <laughs> what was I mentor to you when I was seven years old? You, you were probably nine then. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, Gary, as we said, I, mean, we think, we, I was we a teenager, you, dude. <laughs> you, you broke Gorian, didn't you? Yeah, well, Gloria, Gloria and I came along about the same time as. Uh, oh, okay, as, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> as you and as you and French came along, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I mean, but man, I, you talk about old uh, friendships in this business. You know, one thing about this friendship as you go through it, you know, you spend a lot of years in there. John, you're finding out. I know Hector knows this, but you find after you, you you make friends, you know, when when you first get in the business. And you're damn lucky if you still got those friends, you know, when they finish up with the business. I'm fortunate enough to know the world, and there's so many of them. Hell, you got it. And some of them got to be around. While yeah, I'm right. <laughs> so, Hector, man, thanks a lot for coming on. I know you've had a busy day. You're an outstanding school teacher in the Hillsborough County School System here in, there in the Florida area. There. Thank you for taking time out after you right when you get home from teaching all those kids. And those kids are blessed to have a girl there. But uh, uh, Hector, take us back a little bit. We're talking about Gory and everything. Enlighten us on who, who Gory is and how Gory got in the business and how how uh, Lucha Libre was and how Mexican wrestling was back in back in those days when when you were first you know waking up to the fact that man, my family is special. Well, you know, uh, thank you, Gerald, for you know for giving the accolades, brother. Thank you so much, and John, thank you for also. So you know, my dad he started in about 1937. So wrestling, you know, and that was that was that was a time that Mexico had just joined in because the United States had brought in professional wrestling. Mexico brings it in. A guy from El, they had wrestling in El Paso. The guy saw it in El Paso, where we, you know, where we were raised. And then, interesting, the guy took it to Mexico City, and then it was Lutero who the one he won. Uh, he won the, the the lottery, and so he bought La Arena Mexico. He bought this big, big, big arena, and that's where it's, it all started. And he started wrestling. My dad started. So that, that's where he got his money. I didn't know he won the lottery to, to finance his uh, wrestling. Oh, business. yeah, that's what I understand. Uh, okay. If I'm not mistaken, this is what I understand. He won the lottery. Luderoth won the lottery. Oh. And that's what he started. So my dad was in in uh, in, Guadal in Guadalajara, which is oh, northern Mexico, right about 12, 11, mi 11 hours drive from Mexico City. And my dad was uh, was a uh, uh, he used to be an interpreter because he he his dad was uh, a picker. So they would they were like you know they picked the oranges and all that, and they traveled back and forth between Mexico and Arizona, back and forth, and then. My my grandpa, my grandfather, his father died, and so my dad had to take care of my of his sisters. He had three sisters that he took care of. The fourth one, the, one of the aunts came and picked her up. So he took care of my aunt Barty, my aunt Estella, my aunt Grace, and uh, my aunt Tetra was taken up by another one. These are my aunts, and my dad was you know had to do something you know. So he as he did work as an interpreter. He went in one day he into into my my uncle. He oh he had a brother. My uncle Paul. My uncle Paul was interested in boxing, so they went and looked into it, and my dad saw that they had wrestling there instead of boxing, and he met a guy named Diablo Velasco. He trained him and other people, and then that's that's how he got rolled. 
And what and what and what style did he train him in, actor? Uh, he started it. I think I don't know if he was a heel or babyface, but I know he didn't use his name, Gory Guerrero. He used Joe Morgan because Joe they, Morgan. yeah, because he was a you know he he knew English, right? Right. So he, you know, oh, you know the Gringo, you know, oh, you know, you're going to be Joe Morgan. So they used him as Joe Morgan, and then he started wrestling as 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 as, as you know as he started having some blood, bloody feuds, and he was a guy that. You know he loved the uh, he loved that you know what I mean, and he didn't never back down for a crowd. Uh, what I hear he used to cause riots in Mexico City, and they made the headlines. Gory Guerrero causes a, 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 a you know riots, and anyway, uh, my my brother Mondo right he was born the night that uh, my dad had had a riot, <laughs> and, and so Armando means our army, aren't you know like to arm. So in the in the headlines it said Gory Guerrero arming riots, so they named Mondo, my brother Armando, <laughs> after that. That's wow. great. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, he he had a family. He's got all of us, and uh, and then you know we kind of crazy, you know. <laughs> we had how, how, how many? How kinda, many? How many? How many total? Kinda. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of in the word for that, man. Uh, uh, you, you were off the, how, how many grow offsprings were there? How many siblings? Well, well, you, you got my well, you got a two my two sisters, right? My oldest sister's Cookie, right. her, call her Cookie. Her name is Maria. Then it's Chavo, Chavo Senior, Mando, uh, and then myself. And this I'm uh, going down in ages. And then I have a, a sister six years younger than I. Her name is Linda. And she she was the one that uh, became a airline stewardess on on uh, Southwest. She's uh I think she's she's about to retire, but she don't want to retire because she's <laughs> she's still making a bunch of money, so uh -huh. he loves it. So uh and then and then it came Eddie. Eddie was like the youngest of all of us. Eddie was wow. seven years younger than than Linda, and well thirteen younger from me, and from like Chavo. Chavo had five, so he's by eight. And Chavo was like eighteen years older than Eddie. Wow. Wow. Cookie 19. So Eddie was like, you know, he was like, wow, he was the baby, man. We loved him, man. It was everything. He come, he we we'd be watching TV. He run up, man, and he drop kick you. He's like three, four years old. He uh, drop kick you back and he go, Oh, it's Eddie. <laughs> so, so it's easy to say Eddie was a small brat of the family then, right? Yeah, but you know, because <laughs> we, loved them, we loved them so much. But then, you know, my dad was a very disciplinarian. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, tell, tell tell me this. So your dad uh, certainly had some vision. He had all these boys there, plus he had some beautiful uh, daughters, because I think I've met one or two of them there. But uh, yes. hey, you guys all ended up in amateur wrestling in El Paso at a time where amateur wrestling wasn't a big sport out there. What kind of guided your dad into getting you boys all into athletics? Well, you guys, you guys are going to be interested because Mondo and Chavo, they fell right into it. You know, amateur wrestling in, at, you know, Burgess High School. And uh, then it came my turn. Now, you, you guys don't know about this, but I, I, I was a big guy on band. I, I played trumpet. All right. <laughs> I still play it. You know, I can still play a little bit of trumpet. But uh, I love band. That was my thing. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to. So my, my, my freshman year. <laughs> My dad says to me, "Where are you gonna? Are you gonna join the wrestling team?" And I go, "Dad, I want." So you know, they they all kind of look down on me. So I I joined. <laughs> so I had to go to try to make varsity. The guy that I went against, and it's no lie, the guy was a state champ. And I'm like, man, I couldn't beat him. I'm sorry, but you know, I mean, I was, and he was a senior too. So then the same thing happened to me in sophomore. I'm a sophomore, and then I get another guy that was a state champ too. I remember his name, uh, Archuleta, that was his last name, and I, I couldn't beat him, you know? And then I was I was dieting, you know? So I was like, oh, wow. So my so my, so my uh, uh, junior year, I said, Dad, I'm going to go with my band. So I went with my band, and then we were out eating one time, you know? And we we're out eating, and he says, oh, yeah, Gory, so which oh, which ones are your sons? We will go, yeah, yeah, that's Chavo. He says, yeah. He says, he, he wrestles. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, he's wrestling. He's, He's getting himself, uh, you know, he's, he's wrestling at UTEP with a wrestling uh, club because he had a club. I said, Mondo, oh, yeah, Mondo's doing really good, you know. And then how about him? Oh, he don't wrestle. Yeah, he don't <laughs> wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I go, oh, man, I go, oh, see, I guess I better start doing something. So I tried out. I made the varsity and wrestled. I didn't do too good, but I did all right. Yeah. 
you know, I was, uh, I was, I lost from one, I was weighing 151 yeah. pounds and I wrestled the 119 class. I lost all that weight to, 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 uh, to get pounds. beat, to get beat up. Well, you know, you, you don't have any strength, man. Yeah. So then, then I, I could, I could beat the 126 pounder. I could beat the 132 pounder, the 145 pounder, the 155 pounder gave me some trouble. So I was trying to go up and wait, but the coach didn't like me because Chavo at that time was the was the Rathley coach at Burge, at uh, Jefferson High School. Uh -huh. Burgess and Jefferson were rivals, so my coach hated me because of my brothers my brothers. <laughs> <the coach. laughs> so Chavo had I, heat back then. Oh yeah. Right, well, <laughs> yes and no, you know. And then my mom split. You know, here comes City City Finals. I'm wrestling this boy. You know what I mean? And my mom, mom wow. don't know who to cheer for. <laughs> so you're you're wrestling, you're wrestling uh, your 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 brother's uh, uh, student. Wow, that had to be that in the yeah, family. It was interesting. It was interesting. So then I, I graduated, and then I started helping him out. Oh, who won? Who won, man? Oh, I lost. I lost. Oh, I lost. Oh, I lost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. I'm not. I'm was right. there a was there a riot? <laughs> no, no, no riot. No riot. <laughs> Did you still play? Did you still play in the band at this time? Did you, did you did you do both? Did you still play in the band at this time, or did you quit? Had you had yes. To... Oh yeah. Oh now now I go in and try to blow my trumpet and like, <laughs> and, the, and the director would go, Guerrero, just go to. And they they I was I was playing first trumpet, right? You know that's first punk trumpet parts. You, you get all the you get all the the taps and all that. You get all the neat stuff that you get to play. No, when when I started wrestling, I went all the way to third trumpet, man. That's, <laughs> and that's like like you know, we had like twelve trumpet players. Like I'm a, I'm almost almost in the last seat. I couldn't <laughs> go to trumpet, man. You know, I was dieting. I had to diet so much just to make weight. Anyway, so it was, so, I, it was, so you get out of high school. Was Chavo already starting to professional wrestle as well, or was he just being the wrestler's coach? Well, Chavo Chavo started professional wrestling. I went to uh, I went to community college and I and I and I did and then we had wrestling in Mexico because my dad opened up at Juarez and Juarez is right next door. You remember? I'm sure you took some trips there, didn't you, Daryl? Oh yes. <laughs> what I what I remember, yes. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've Jerry, Terry, you wanna, Jerry, you want to tell us about those trips? I, you took? I, I had a classic one with Terry Funk. We'll get into it a little bit later. I'm sure <laughs> about Terry. Hey, yeah, I got uh, something I can tell you. I, got I know. I'm yeah, sure you, you do. do. <laughs> Especially with with gorgeous George and Buddy Cole. Wow! <laughs> really, gorgeous, <Yeah. laughs> gorgeous George Junior, right? Yeah, gorgeous George, George Junior. Yeah, yeah, Junior. Yeah, gorgeous George Junior and Buddy Cole. That's some funny stuff, man. Did it? Did he? Did George have that lavender Cadillac at the time he was out there? I think so. I think so. That was painted by Briscoe Brothers Body Shop, by the way. I really? How about yeah. that? That's great. <laughs> Do you want to? You want me to tell that story about about uh, Buddy? Of course, of course we do. All right, let's go. For it. Let's go for it. So, so my dad gets up about oh about four thirty in the morning, and I heard him get up. So it's still dark, and I and I I usually usually get up during the night, and then I went up and I looked at him, and he says, "You want to go with me?" And I go. He was getting dressed. I go. Where are we going, Dad? We got to go to Juarez and bail somebody out. So I said, okay. So. Now it's about five, five, five o'clock. We're going over the border, 530. We get to the jail. So we get to the jail and we find out that gorgeous George Jr. is in jail. So my dad calls, uh, my dad had called the, uh, the well, they used to stay at the, what was the name of the, the, the hotel? Remember, it was uh, like a motel. I'm trying to remember uh, Del Camino, something like that. In El Paso, yeah, so, so, so yeah, right across the border, right on the yeah, border. Right there. So it was across the border, but you know, Del Camino. That's I think that's what it called, Del, Del Camino Motel. And the guys would like to stay there because you could drive your car and he parked right next to the motel, and that's where you're right. You're right. He did have that. He did yeah. have that Cadillac. Big ass parking lot, right? Right, yeah. right, circle parking lot. So he never answered the phone. He wouldn't answer the phone. So that's why my dad went down there, and I went with him. So. You know, gorgeous had gorgeous had that all long hair with blonde, right? So he's in the he, he it, my dad goes in. He talks to the to the to the uh, chief because my dad had a lot of connections in, in Mexico. He talks to the chief. He says, "Yeah, Gordon, we'll bring him out." So he's walking, and you can hear all these whistles from the Mexican prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> 
like whistles and whistles and whistles. And, he, and he, you know, Gorgeous George is coming out like, like, yeah. like, yeah. oh, and he comes out and he goes, oh, Corey, Corey, thank you. You arrived. And he grabbed my dad and hugged him. And they were still whistling about it. They, they brought him through the bar or something. We took him. So we take him back to the hotel. And then we find it. Buddy's over there, you know, with some lady friend. <laughs> And then George goes and knocks on the door. Hey man, why did you leave me? What the heck? He said, hey, I didn't leave you, man. I said, you got you got taken by the cops. What can I do? I said, <laughs> you got taken by the cops. You could have called Corey. You could have called Corey or something. He says, me finally. And you know what happened was that they recognized him, and the one of the guards or one of the main guys at the at the jail in Mexico, Juarez, called my dad. That's how my dad found out. Uh, wow. Wow. So, so, so Buddy so, Colt, once, once Gorgeous George got arrested, Buddy Colt left. Yeah. <laughs> now, let me tell you how it happened. So, I asked George, and George could, I mean, uh, Buddy, Buddy told, used to tell this joke all the time. And well, no, this situation. Well, they were in the bar. Remember that bar? They were going right over the downtown, and then it was to the right, and they, all the guys used to go, and it was kind of like a wild, crazy ass bar. It was a lot of, a lot of, Got a lot of cowboys there, you know what I mean? So they went in, and some girl kept messing with Buddy, and 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 she he shoot him away, or or George and shoot him away, and then he, Buddy went around and then got to where George was, and then George said, "What's going on?" He says, "Oh, it's just, it's just if they come to tell you, he says, don't tell them." What did he say? Don't <laughs> don't tell them your name. That's what he said. Don't tell them your name. So they came in, they asked, they asked, they asked uh, a Buddy Cole thing. Buddy Cole, I can't remember what he said. He said another name. So then he asked George, and George said, George says Buddy Colt. So they took him. <laughs> That's what happened. And so, so then, George, George being a smart ass got him arrested. Yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> no, no, George, George didn't get arrested. Buddy was the one that missed him. Oh, with Buddy, the okay. But, uh, Buddy was, yeah. okay. So, but he told him, but he went in and he told him, hey, you know, don't tell him your name. So he, I guess he wanted to <laughs> screw up, buddy. So he said, buddy, oh, boom, they took him. <laughs> so they took Gorgeous George thinking he was Buddy Colt. Yes. And Buddy, yes. Was buddy Colt was. <laughs> so. Yes. Yes. And it was Buddy that, that that did the thing. I can't remember what he did to the lady. That girl, you know, in Mexico, they come and sit in your lap. They wanted you to buy drinks. And, you know, that's that's just the nature of the, of the, of the bar, you know, seen in Mexico. You know, it's like. Being I wouldn't red- know that. <laughs> oh yeah, I read that book. You know, you think, you think, you hear it here in Tampa, Gerald. <laughs> so I, I always wondered what went on down in those bars. <laughs> so gorgeous George gets arrested because they think he's Buddy Colt, and the real right. Buddy Colt leaves him and goes back to cross with all the girls. With all the girls. <laughs> no, <laughs> while while gorgeous think... George is in a Mexican jail being whistled at by the prisoner. <laughs> there you go. And that was some that was some funny stuff. And uh, and, and you know, Buddy used to tell it. I don't know. I'm surprised you guys never heard it. Every time I'd I, I'd go up down and say, "You remember that?" I, I've I've heard that story about Buddy Coat, but it wasn't yeah. exactly <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's great, brother. That's great. <laughs> That's amazing. What a crazy <laughs> times. I we <laughs> going across work when you work those border towns on either side were some for some pretty wild times. Oh yeah, man! It's crazy. Them crazy times, man. Crazy times. Your father was your father was a promoter there in El Paso. Did he promote Mexican towns also, or just on the, yes, sir. On the Texas side? Yes, sir. Look, when my dad started promoting. Uh, I I graduated from El, uh, from uh, Burgess, and I started going to community college. And my dad, we had we we had already had like four or five years, and we had he had Channel Five on on Saturday nights. Now, my dad was that we had the most popular show on the border. And at that time, the uh, Kojak was a big thing in the United States. And they, it came out at nine o'clock. We had better ratings than Kojak. Wow. And my dad, my dad double checked it and this and that. And we had better ratings because it was wild and crazy, man. My dad brought and thought up some stuff that, you know, they went up in the, at the thing. One time we, we, we had a guy named Frankenstein. And he 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 wore the he wore the thing, you know. So to get him to get him over, I was the announcer. I used to come out and announce, and then I would announce. And so when I went up to announce, 
Frankenstein decides to attack me. <laughs> and he attacks me. And then he throw me out. Mando comes in, boom, boom, boom. And then Mando's having, and now Mando, and then he gets him with a, with, remember how the mummy used to do the, the thing, Gerald? Right. Yeah. yeah. And so Mando had the thing with a, you know, and start bleeding through the mouth. Right. So now I come back in, he still puts my, puts my head, stops, he's stomping on my head now with this big old boo, right? And he's got my brother, he's got my brother done. So now my dad comes in, hits him with a, hits him with a, with a chair. The, you know, he wouldn't move. And the people are screaming, and this is right live on TV. So finally, another wrestler came in, and between him and my dad hitting him with chairs, finally he, he left. He left the he left the ring, and 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 that made Frankenstein. <laughs> so my that's kind of shows that my dad did, you know, and it and it brought it it, it brought it brought ratings. Yeah, and, and uh, Hector, growing up in the growing up in that business with your dad being a promoter and, and your brother, your brother's just starting into the business there. And and you 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 being a son, you probably had just about every type of job that there was in, in a promotion. And then yeah, is that yeah. is that how you learned the business so well? Because all all of you and your brothers, you guys really know the business, but I can see why you guys were filled in an outro mode. You just said you were an outro, you probably did timekeeping. He probably did the list of all. He probably did some referee in there. How was that growing up? I mean, you got and, and were the guys ribbing you guys all the time because I know guys get around, around, around promoter son and they rib them a lot. And how was that? How was that? Well, they ribbed us a lot, uh, dear, but you know, but we get in the ring with them and we could, you know, <laughs> my picture yeah. helped. You know what I'm doing? You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. yeah. So. No, they they try to stretch me, but you know, and ah, I I give you know I I knew one move the what is it the grapevine so yeah. I I split them open with a grapevine. <laughs> you know? yeah. that, that was my thing. I couldn't. I didn't know the I didn't know the wizards or anything. And, and so and so the ribbon ribbon kind of went away real quick after after you knew, uh, you showed them you could wrestle. No, <laughs> Mexican wrestlers they rib you all the time, man. Yeah. And some funny stuff really really happened, you know, and but. Uh, there was some more stuff that really happened a lot, lot, lot funner than California. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, yeah. get in there. Tell us a couple of stories about California. All right. You remember Colossal Colosetti? Have you ever heard of him? No. Colossal Colosetti is an Argentinian wrestler that wrestled for Mexico, came to wrestle for Mike LaBelle in uh, Los Angeles, Cal uh, uh, California in 1978, where I made my debut as a, as a, in the United States as a, as a wrestler. So we're we're in Bakersfield, California. I don't know if you've ever been to wrestling in Bakersfield, California. Eileen Eaton. No, it wasn't Eileen Eaton. I'm trying to remember her name, but she was uh she was the main uh lady at, at Bakersfield. But anyway, let me let me get into it. So Leo Garibaldi's the booker. You remember Leo? I remember Leo very well, yeah. Okay, so Leo Garibaldi says, okay, you know, it's okay to talk finishes and everything, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Good. So Leo says, "I, I, ha I was outside. They were, they were prepping me up to start me in, 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 uh, in, in January at the big battle royal. So it was about, mm, I'd say, you no know, late November or the early December, and we were in Bakersfield, and there were some people that I had met, and they had a snake. So I had, I had the opportunity to go." I'm, I'm not afraid of snakes and so I went and grabbed it and it wrapped all around my arm and around my neck and it was a small snake so I, I I don't remember it wasn't very it wasn't venomous but it was a snake so I went into the dressing room to scare guys and Moondog Maid was there was it <laughs> some of the some of the other wrestlers they were crazy about it they were scared of the snake so he came in and Leo sees me with a snake and he says where'd you get the snake he said well it belongs to her you know one of the fans he says we're going to use the snake for the for the finish tonight so it was it was alex ko perez versus uh black gorman i remember now so they say okay he says leo says this is what we want to do at towards the end of the match mando you're going to have the snake and 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 Gorman, you're gonna be. I mean, uh, 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 Gorman, you're gonna be cheating and uh, cheating and cheating and cheating on on uh, on 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 Alex on Alex Perez. He says, when finally this is when the cue is given, Mondo, you're gonna roll in with a snake. He says, uh, Gorman, you see the snake, you you cower down and you scream, and then you start running around the ring. 
Alex Perez, but at that time, he wants you to get up. And as he comes around, bam, you know, he used to do the KO punch. So he gives him a KO punch, the same thing, boom, and then that'll be it. So the same thing happens. I think Mondo jumps up in the ring, boom. Alex uh, being, uh, uh, he starts running around the ring. Uh, uh, Gorman, here comes Alex Perez, boom, he knocks him down and then covers him one, two, three. The people are screaming and hollering, and what a great match. And I mean, the, ec the ecstasy and at that little, it was a round, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the arena there was great. It, it was magnifying. So Leo has said afterwards, go put the snake on Gorman's chest because Gorman, he wasn't afraid of the snakes. He says, yeah, put it on my chest. And I'll act like, oh, and I'm going to go crazy. And he says, okay. So Mando goes and puts the snake. Now this match was a, forgive me, I didn't tell you, this match was a lumberjack match. So there, all the wrestlers were around, Chavo, uh, Macau, Mata, uh, I can't remember all the all the guys, uh, Colossa Colossetti, now you remember that name, Colossa Colossetti, and then you had all the other guys that were there, oh, uh, uh, Outlaw Ron Bass, I think, uh, I think Moondog was there too. So Colossetti jumps in the ring, he doesn't know any English, but he speaks very good Spanish, Argentinian Spanish, but he, you know, we understand him. He grabs the snake. And the people are hollering and screaming, but he grabbed it off. off. When when he had when Gorman had it on his chest, he ran in and he went, oh. and then he started rolling it around. <laughs> and the <laughs> snake going around, going around, and he threw it into the most dense part of the can. No. The <laughs> the and the bleachers went like this. Boom. There was nobody there. <laughs> I bloody had it on the snake. He gave me the dirtiest look, man, and he ran and picked it up and this and that. I was concerned about the snake, right? Uh, and then we turned around, and then every wrestler in the ring was cracking up, brother. I mean, uh, everybody uh, was cracking up. Even Leo in the back, in the back dresser was cracking up. <laughs> That's one wild, wild, crazy time. Wow. <laughs> How great was that? There was an old Coliseum there in L.A., right? Yeah. Is no, that the, the Coliseum? Beggar, Beggar's Trail. No, oh, Bakersfield. Bakersfield, Bakersfield, yeah, yeah, we're uh... Bakersfield. Uh, Strombo Where Stadium. College is from? Wait, wait, hold on. It was called Strombo Stadium, if I remember right, and and uh, and it was uh, Strombo's wife that used to used to be there. Oh, you know who was there? Roddy, Roddy Piper was there Roddy too. Roddy Piper. Oh yeah, Roddy was there. Uh, oh, there's other guys that I I can't remember the names, you know, but Roddy was there. A lot, a lot of good, 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 great so, people. So you, you and Hot Rod broke in basically at the same time, then, right? Or well, had, had he, any couple of years of? I think he had a couple of years. Well, you know, right? I started in '73 in Mexico, so I don't know when he started, but I know when I met him. I, I didn't look. I, I didn't even know that Roddy and I were almost the same age, because he always treated me like a minor. <laughs> <laughs> He did, man. And then I go, you know. Well, it was all your, your damn older brothers, you know. You always yeah, seem like you're, you were the youngest one that I can remember, you know. Yeah, but, you know, like, he treated me like his younger brother. Like, you know, oh, yeah, you're just a pup and all this and that. Yeah. Then I then he then he passed away, and I, I looked him up on, on the and I find out that we're almost the same age. And I go, yeah. <laughs> one on me, man. Yeah. <laughs> he had did a huge... He had a huge did angle with your brother Chavo out there in L.A., didn't yeah, he? Yes, yes. In California, him and Chavo packed him in, man. I mean, golly. Awesome, you know. That was Roddy's first, like, big packing in crowds and drawing crowds was with your brother Chavo, right? I don't know that because no, I can't... was. There you go, Gerald. Gerald, Gerald should know. 1977 was uh, kind of when I started going in towards the end of the year and traveling with him. But I had been in Mexico all those all those years. Those other years, I was I was working for uh, um, what was his name? It was it wasn't Luderoff. It was the Independents, and the Independents were very big in Mexico at that time, and they worked the big bull ring, the Mexico, you know, the big bull rings and stuff like that. But the 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 circumstances in California were awesome, man. I mean, and Roddy Roddy and Chavo would pack him in, yeah. and then you had other other guys, great guys. Uh, Doctor Oda was there at that time. We used to call him Doctor Mota, if you know uh -huh. what that is, because he used to like it. You know what I mean? <laughs> 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 in Spanish, we call it Mota. So we go, Hey, Doctor Mota, how you doing? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, Jerry yeah, understands Juarez and Dr. Mota. <laughs> <laughs> that's 
uh, 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 Hector, take us back a little bit to about Mexico when you're first starting, you know, the independency, like you said, man, they were on fire at the time. They were, they were actually hotter than some of the major, major promotions there. The, yeah, the gimmick, can... the gimmicks there. I mean, I used to love to watch going on, going to te te turn the television on two o'clock in the morning somewhere down west and get one of those lucha stations, man, sit there all night, watch, watch, watch the wrestling. And the moves that they were making, and, and and the outfits they were wearing. What what kind? Of, tell us about the outfits. Okay, well, a lot of a lot of outfits. I wore outfits too when I went to Mexico. But my first times, I when I went to Mex. Listen, Mexico was big on the things with the masks, and yeah. the reason because of the you know the identity and all that. The most famous, you know, you remember Gerald uh, El Santo, and El Santo would draw big crowds for us in El Paso. Right. And New Orleans too, you know, when yeah. my dad thought El Santo, he packed in not the small uh, uh, bull ring, because in Mexico we have bull rings in Juarez. Right. He went to the Monumental, which is the big bull ring, and he packed well, it in. What, 50,000 50, people, right? Yeah, man, big. It was wow. big, big Dude. time, you know? And this and, is back in the 70s, man. I mean, when things yes, were, wow. It, and 60s, and, you know, remember my dad was with him too, because my dad and him were called the Atomic Pair. And and they were heels at that time. Then he became a baby face. My dad came to the United States, and El Santo became what the icon that he is in Mexico. He right. became the famous movie star. And they did all these things: the the mummies versus El Santo, Frankenstein versus El Santo, the those, vampire versus Those El were Santo. great movies. Those, yeah, I, I, I loved them. I loved oh them. My, they, were <laughs> they were awesome. They were awesome. So they were like those, the old uh, Star Trek uh, movies, you know, with, yeah, with yeah, yeah, you know, and they, 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 you know, they were kind of hokey, but they were great in the fact that they were just hokey. I mean, they were great. Let me tell you how how the independent scene went from Luderoth, because Luderoth was the main guy. And this is what happened. You had like six or seven guys that broke away before before anybody broke away. El Santo broke away before El Santo broke away. My dad broke away. Because my dad was the uh, light heavyweight champion of the world that they had. And they wanted him, uh, I don't can't remember, I think they wanted him to drop it to Ray Mendoza. And my dad wasn't in agreement because they didn't want to They didn't want to uh, work with him in Juarez. And my dad wanted to do some, I don't know, I guess something with him. But that's what I understand. So uh, uh, El Santo became like the icon thing. And then you got all these, all of these, all of a sudden you get all these people like El Gallo Tapado, Blue Demon. You got, uh, oh, got so many names. Me, I, I worked as a Lasertron with a different outfit. In the United States, I had Lasertron, you know, with the silver, the mask and all that. In Mexico, it was, I was like uh, like uh, red, white, and blue. with And they put wings on me. Uh -huh. So uh, Art Bar had been there. Remember Art? Right. Art Bar had been there, and he's worked at Love Machine before me. Huh. And he got over, like, he got over big. Yeah. And when they took off his mask, because, you know, he's gringo. So gringo and the little Mexican girls, oh, la, la, you know. <laughs> I love Art. He's great. I, <laughs> yeah. I'm him, man. He was great. I, 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 when I was there, we, we, we were very, we all lived at the, at, the, uh, at, at the Madrid Hotel, downtown Mexico City. And Tonga was there. Uh, Art Bar was there, Mondo Chavo, and Hector Guerrero were there. We were all there. We were family. We would go down after the matches. We'd meet up even when they meet up. We were there in town. We'd meet up and we'd go drinking. We'd stay drinking two or three in the morning. We'd have fun and talk and and say stuff like we're doing right now, man. This is great. What a great crew you had down there. That's yeah. that's an awesome Hall of Fame crew. Let me let me tell you how the the independence started. Okay, I was going to tell you that. There were seven guys that decided to break away from from uh, from Luderoth, and the reason was because Luderoth was paying two or three hundred pesos per match. So here comes a couple of promoters, independent promoters, and they started talking to these guys, and they're talking to Aníbal, they're talking to uh, El Santo, Blue Demon, Rayo de Jalisco, these top top guys, uh, and a couple of the heel guys. Uh, Renato Torres. I can't remember some of the other 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 boys that there were that were really there, big, 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 big stars that Luderoff had. And so he's they they offer him two or three thousand pesos now. So they're going like two hundred, 
3,000. We're going to go work over here. So six of them, or seven, I can't remember, had broke away, and they broke away. And they, and then, so this guy that used to work for, for Luteroff, his name was Francisco Flores. He comes up, and he goes, and he recruits them, and he starts he starts booking them out to independent promoters. And that's where it started. And then, and then it got bigger, bigger, bigger. And then when I went down, I, you know, I got like, I got to, I got to uh, be traveling with Solitario, very, very famous in Mexico, Aníbal. And then for sure, El Santo is like, like family to me because of, of my dad, not because of me, because of my dad. So they, it, got, it grew bigger, bigger, bigger. And then Mendoza, the uh, right Mendoza and their kids, they, you know, they were the villanos, the villains. You remember we had them in, in WCW. So they 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 joined the group, and, and then all of a sudden you got all these other wrestlers that are that are bailing out. Now Luderos is going to have to pay some money instead of pocketing all that. But you know, I mean, Cali, you know, it just it takes it takes a turn. You know, it's I guess that's how did, life is. Sometimes. Did the independents have TV? So did they uh, have like regular towns, or were they just promoting kind of ad hoc around Mexico? You know, Mexico really never had TV a lot till later. And at those times, they really didn't have to have TV because the, 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 the magazines, the magazines created, created superheroes. Now, the magazines, were they the, the U.S. magazines or were they uh, Mexican magazines? Mexican magazines. So you guys had your own version of wrestling review and all that stuff. Yes. We had the Mucha Lucha. We had Lucha Libre. And then, then, you had, and then they started coming out with all these colored with colors right. and, and then you know when they used to be like a green ink with with white and then all of a sudden boom here comes color a color magazine and then all of a sudden they went wow they went crazy so I, then, I, I'd, I'd always heard the rumor that that tv kind of sparked all those colorful outfits that the lucha guys wore but it wasn't that the, the, the outfits was around before what you're saying basically before tv then right Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then, you know, which kind of really started with the TV, it was AAA. But Luderoth was getting into it, too, at that time, too, because, you know, he was trying to keep up with, the, you know, trying to keep up with it. So and, and then he changed it from, from it, was, it used to be it used to be called Empresa Mexicana de Lucha Libre, E-M-L-L. -L. So then he changed it to Consejo Mundial de Lucha Libre, which is they made it like a made it like a world thing like yeah. like you know wwe you know like they're so they're similar to, similar to japan with the magazines because japan yes, was sir. like that japan you got over by being in the magazines yes sir yes sir that was that was a deal and 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 it's like uh you know it's like like you know like superstar uh, you know like like superman and and batman and you know and, and people read and then they would make like my dad had a couple of uh uh you know I mean, cartoons that they made about him. Not cartoons, right, but, you know, right. like, you know, like a Batman. Uh, yeah, sure. You know what I mean? And and all that. My dad had that couple. And so they were doing with El Santo. They were doing with Aniva. They were doing with Blue Demon. And they started doing that with all. And then they started just showing the wrestling in, into the into the, uh, in, into the magazines. And it started with color. When I went there in 91 and 92 as, as Lasertron, uh, boy, they died. They, they, they had me on the magazines and everything. That's what got me over. That is so cool. Did, did you ever get the tag with your dad? Was your dad still wrestling at all when you were, when you were wrestling? Oh, yeah. You got to see me saying yes. And I loved every bit of it, man. He would teach us, like, we would be in a battle royal, and he'd teach us how to hit. So he'd get the get, get the. <laughs> Put their arms over the over the over the over the ropes, and he says, "Listen up here," and then right there, boom, man! <laughs> and then do you understand? He says, "Yes, sir." Now do it. <laughs> Come on, boy. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That had to be a thrill, though, to grow up. Your dad's this famous, famous guy, and then when you're breaking into the same business and being able to tag with your dad, that had to be the thrill. Yes, it was. Once I once I I tasted it like the professional, the professional part, it just became part of me. And then, you know, it's a gift too. Uh, some people have gifts, like you all, you both have very beautiful gifts and you're in the ring. So my dad's gift passed on to 
poor boys. You know what I mean? That it's just yeah. great. I just, uh, well, what, what what part of your life, uh, Hector, did you realize? My dad's special, man. My dad's known by everybody. I mean, I'm sure you know as you're a kid, you're going around local, uh, around around El Paso, around Juarez, and everything. Hey, Mr. Grail. Hey, Mr. Grail. Well, at what point did you realize that my dad is, is a superhero? Well, I tell you what, I was about four or five years old. I still remember it. And we were going, and my dad was a heel in Mexico. And I went to him to a town called Piedras Negras, which is uh, Black Rocks. That's the name of the town. And we drove there. El Santo was there with him. And then when they're out, there were some people there that my dad, my dad knew, and he put me with them because I couldn't go in the dressing room at that time. And he said, take care of them. So the, the, the people that were with me turned around and said, don't tell anybody that Gory Guerrero is your father. And I go, why? <laughs> don't. Don't tell nobody. Well, I didn't know he was a heel. You know what I mean? <laughs> so then I saw the match. My dad was a heel of a heel, brother. The <laughs> ice wow, wow, wow. I saw this old lady cussing my dad out. And I'm going, what the heck is going on here? And then I said, okay, well, my dad's kind of special here. <laughs> <laughs> As a heel, brother. And then later on, yeah, we once. So your was, first, that's, that's awesome. Your first experience of uh, knowing who he was, he was a damn heel, man. That's yeah, awesome. <laughs> but hey, but a hell of a heel, bro. Yeah, yeah. hell of a heel. Yeah. Hell did, of a heel. Did, did you ever ask your dad, like, dad, what happens out there? You turn into a different guy. Because no, you were never... smart in the business, so did, did, did it confuse you at all? Look, let me let me tell you. My dad run ran a tight ship at home, and we were we had to, especially with Mando. So, <laughs> Chavo and I, I mean Chavo too, once in a while, but Mando, hmm, Mando would challenge my dad. So my dad had to run a tight ship with us. So. As we grew up, he was very, you know, we had to make sure that we made our bed. We made sure that, you know, if my mom needed something. I had to go get it. Like, you know, go get me some tortillas, man. I remember going to this place called Nachitas. It was grocery. And I go get there three dozen of tortillas for, for the morning and, and ride my bicycle all the way over there, which is about, I don't know, two or three miles, get it and then come back and have to, you know, for, for the breakfast. But uh, we... We were, you know, we were we were supposed to do our beds. We cleaned, we did, and then Mando and Chavo rebelled, <laughs> and they left, and then that left me all by myself. So uh, <laughs> I kind of liked it. I had the bedroom for myself, man. But then Eddie got big, and then Eddie was sharing it with me, so we still had fun. <laughs> How did you end up in Spain? I, I was looking at your stuff was online, uh, getting ready for the show, and I didn't ever. I, you were in Spain. Was there a territory over there at the time? How'd you end up? In oh Spain? yeah, yeah. The, the territory was a uh, uh, hill Esparza, and he ran out of uh, uh, Valencia, and he had another guy that ran out. I can't remember his name right now. If it comes up, I'll, I'll, I'll write. I'll tell you. And he ran with another guy that that did it in Madrid. So. Chavo, Gerald, I think you'll understand this. Chavo was going to go with Mando to Spain because they caught, they made a, they made, they made, you know, they wrote to the promoter. Promoter said, okay, yeah, we'd like to see you the two guys come just to, you know, to get the experience and to go to, to go to Europe. So uh, Chavo gets an opportunity to come where? Florida. Do you remember that? Okay. So, okay. So Chavo came to Florida. So now there's an opening. I'm walking around this good, you know, around the, around the arena that day, and then they come. Hey, so you want to go to? You want to go to Spain? <laughs> That's with me, man. And then they say, Yeah. I says Chavo can't go because Chavo's going to Florida. And then my dad said, Yeah. He says, You know, he says, uh, We'll help you get there. And then my uncle was there. My uncle Paul was there, and he says, You know, I'll loan you the money so you can buy your ticket. And I said, Really, uncle? He said, Yeah. So we prepared Monday night, and that's where I went to uh, Spain. We did we did three and a half months. We were supposed to go to England afterwards, but uh, we were going to be off for like about a month, man. And we're like, just, you know, we had enough money to last us out, but we were going to have to be on a tight ship. So we were waiting, waiting, waiting. Now, so I said, you know what? I'm going to go walk. So I went downtown uh, Valencia and I found a place where it said student fare rates and, and, and then at like half prices. So I went in and I told, I showed him my, I had still had my, 
my uh, my card, and Mondo was still going to uh, Mondo was going to UTEP at that time, and so we showed our cards, and we were able to get back home. So we decided to go back home instead of wait a month and a half for you know for things to start kicking up. How so, was the territory uh, in Spain? Was it good? Did you? <laughs> like- it was great. We were we were in Valencia. Now Valencia is right next to the ocean in the Mediterranean. So a lot of the guys that came. John Breston, I can't remember some of the names. Uh, Ricky Starr, remember Ricky Starr? Right. Yeah, Ricky Starr was there. John Breston, uh, Antonio Montoro, some of the other people that a lot of Aledo, uh, Benito Murcia. All these guys were were Spanish wrestlers. Some of them, and some of them were French guys would come, and then uh, uh, German guys would come in. I don't remember their names. John Breston was one. I guess no, he was he was French. And he was about as tall as Andre, uh, Gerald. Uh, John Breston, I remember him. He was big because he could where, barely... Where, where was he from? I think France, too. France, wow. France, if I remember right, because Breston, you know, that's John Breston. That, that, was, that was France. I thought he was German, but he wasn't. He ended up being French. But anyway, he wasn't as tall as, as Andre, but he was big and he was thick, but he was tall, too. So... Uh, Ended up, ended up having having the, that opportunity to uh, to see guys come from Spain. I mean, we're already there. The Spanish were there. Then you had French coming. You had uh, uh, Germans coming from 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 Germany because they would come and vacation and work with with uh, with Mister Esparza. So we got the, we got a chance to see everything, brother. We got a chance to see. We got it French wrestling. Oh, in England, Ricky Starr. Here comes Ricky Starr. He's English. So we're getting we're getting all this, all these, uh, all these, uh, and others. Other wrestlers came that were from England, and and we were getting the English, the German, the French, and this great, great matches, man, great matches. But uh, uh, there was a guy named Tito Copa. Maybe you might remember him. His name. He was an Argentinian wrestler. So we we're, we're in Madrid. Mando says, hurry, hurry, man. Hurry up. Let's, we had just wrestled. Hurry up. Take a shower, man. This match is going to be awesome. So what is it? Just just come and see. So Mando, and later on, I heard a little bit. I just never paid attention. They, they, uh, they, they, they wanted Tito to wrestle the Spanish, what is it, heavyweight lifting champion. He was a he, he was a national heavyweight lifting champion, and they were training him to wrestle. And so Tito, they wanted him. Tito wasn't going to do a job. <laughs> he, was, he wasn't going to do a job. Tito Copa was about oh, what is it, five eight, five seven, but he was like a round ball. Man, he was tough. So the so we went out to see the match because Tito said, you know, if he hits me hard. I'm going to put him out. So John, like this guy starts wrestling Tito. Tito, he backs Tito up. And this is the first, in, in Spain, you have four falls, four, four falls. You have, uh, and then there's there are five minutes of each and that's the end of the match. So that's how they do it in Spain. So they had four rounds of uh, five minutes a piece. And they had like one or two minutes in between. They give you the. They had seconds. They come in with the towels and they air you out. You know, kind of like, kind of like, uh, like boxing. So Tito comes up and this big guy. He's like almost twice his size, and he pushes Tito into the into the first into the third rope. But his head is hitting the third rope, and he goes down and he pushes him into the second rope. And then he rears back and he hits him with a big old a big old forearm smash. And Tito, boom, Tito, Tito went like this. And he looked at him and he liked that. He rocked around. The guy said, ah, I get you. And then he went down. He kicked him from behind the knees. The guy was coming down. He caught him and he put him out like that. I've never seen anything faster than that. And I mean, out. He was out. So then the referee's saying, and he says, come on, count him. Count him out. <laughs> He's not moving. It's just, he's not moving. And so he's telling, come on, get him up because, you know, because of the, of the blood flow. He says, he says no, he says, yeah. So he, Tito goes and grabs his, his jacket, puts it over, and he puts it over like he's dead. <laughs> put it over the thing. And then he said, now you can go to sleep. And he walked out. <laughs> and so, the guy was still out. Yes. 
So the referee, no, the referee jumped on him right away, started, picked him up and started hitting him in the back and massaging his neck. And the guy woke up and he thought he thought he was still, still in the match. So he said, where is he? He says, no, you lost. <laughs> so we go back into the dressing room. Oh, man, the promoter's cutting the rug on Del Tito. Oh, cool. And Tito's saying, I told you, he says, if he hits me one time, he says, you uh -huh. don't know how to hit. He says, I'm not taking it. You know what? They never booked him again. I'm, I'm not no good. <laughs> Oh, oh, the, no, the, the white lifter. No, the Tito, they booked Tito. They didn't yeah. book the other guy again. No, they couldn't. <laughs> no, but Tito, Tito, no, they, no, they, they booked Tito because he was a draw. He was a draw. He was, a, he was from Argentina. You know, he was a draw. What, he's was, a, it, he's, was, it, was it like a summer season in Spain? So was it just like these guys who say came down on vacations? So was a summer season in Spain, didn't run to, probably during the winter? Look, we we it, when we got there, it was it was uh, I had just finished school, so it was a begin the very beginning of June, May, the last of May, very beginning of June, yeah. and it lasted till about uh, September or September the half the half uh, first week of September, so it it was all the summer months, right? So and then you that was that was kind of with the, some of those uh, vacation spots, resort towns, yeah. you know, it's easy to get talent there, you know, and, and it, they'd run during the, the nice months when, when yes. the first were out. That's how, that's how Florida started too. Yeah. And you know, really? yes, is, I, yeah. wow. Look, Florida was a seasonal territory. Hey Jerry, you time. want to tell us anything about you and Chavo down in Florida? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I know, yeah. Trouble, trouble got me in trouble at home a few times. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did that. Good. Okay, let's see. I gotta hear this story. Uh, well, uh, I mean, you know the, the the Imperial Room out here, right, Hector? Yeah, the, the Imperial. Old Imperial. Yeah, well, that, John, it was a, it was a honky talk like Texas wish they had, man. Wasn't it? Wasn't it, Hector, man? It, it was a wild. I mean, you can see George Jones and you can see Boxcar Willie in there. I mean, it, it was, the wrestlers controlled the place. So, so there, there was a what was that? Freddie Fender was in town, and uh, and so we got a bottle of tequila. I don't know why we got tequila. Oh my I God. Got to, <laughs> and we went to see Freddie Fender, man, Chavo. It's classic, oh, man. Love it. And so we stayed. We did finally the, the place closed down two, three o'clock in the morning. We still had some of our tequila left, and Freddie wanted some shots with it. So. Man, we sat there all night long singing songs with Brady Fender and drinking. <laughs> yeah, right. Brady, greatest time I ever had. Of course, I got, we walked out of the bar and the sun was coming up and I had to go home. <laughs> and, then, and Barbara didn't much appreciate uh, Chavo after that. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. I've been, That's I've been the, uh, the cause of many of that. And, 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 and out, out here in my backyard. I had a product called Odessa Orange. You could use your imagination with that. Odessa <laughs> John, John, you've heard of them. You and, and, and Hector, you you probably uh, partake in it. So we had we had a big party out here at Harvest Time for the Odessa Orange. So you, uh, Chavo comes out and so I, I would buy chicken, would buy beef. He makes all the uh, the, the, the 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 food, you know, the tamales, uh, the, the burritos, and all that. We have a big feast. <laughs> While we're harvesting the uh, uh, the the orange grove out out back of my house here, so yeah, I've had some good times with that man. In Japan, man, in Japan, he and I went over there, and and you know Dick Barge, of course, you know uh, yeah. Yeah. what was the destroyer? Yes, sir. Me, me, me and me and Ricky Gibson and Chavo. Every night we got to, we got to to come 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 see Coach. You know, you come and see Coach. You guys are acting up a little bit. We were told two or three times we're going to be sent home, and it's all because of of, of Chavo's fault. Whatever yeah, yeah. my fault. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's whatever my fault. Or oh, Ricky it's Chavo's fault. <laughs> None yeah. of, it wasn't your fault at all, right? <laughs> Dick Barge tried to get us thrown off the airplane over the. We were going from Tokyo to Hawaii. Going halfway home, he tried to get us thrown off the airplane going home. Wow. <laughs> And uh, I don't know why, but I guess we got a little inebriated and a little loud on there. <laughs> you think? Yeah. <laughs> well, we had a ball. We always had a ball. We never got in trouble, but we got in trouble internally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. 
Hey, H- Hector, not not to jump ahead, but uh, your, your your brother Chavo, uh, you know, came up with the idea for the storyline, the biggest one for me and Eddie, you know, with, with give, your mother having the heart attack in El Paso. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the, story, the story of it, I don't know if I've ever told you, I, I'm in the dressing room and Chavo and Eddie pull me aside, you know, and I, you know, I, and I, you know, Eddie was like a, like a brother to me, you know, I loved Eddie. And, and so he said, so we got an idea. And they start telling me about the storyline. I said, that's incredible. You know, give uh, Mrs. Guerrero a heart attack on Mother's Day while she's honoring Gory Guerrero in El Paso in the hometown. I said, that's incredible. And and uh, Chavo says, you know, she'll take like a little bump down. And Eddie would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Our mom is not taking a bump. And Chavo, Chavo <laughs> knows. Very, very, very protective of her. Right? <laughs> Chavo knows now he's got him hooked. So he says, like, look, don't worry, John. I'll take care of her. Maybe he just like hits her with a little clothesline or something. <laughs> and, then, and Eddie, Eddie goes, Craig goes, Chavo, John is not touching our mother. And he goes, okay, how about just a big boot? And now, now Eddie is about to fight Chavo, and it's only us three in the back dressing room. I'm like, oh my goodness, I got a brother fight between two Guerreros. What do I do now? <laughs> so, so finally, Chavo, Chavo's got Eddie. And Eddie knows Chavo's working him up, but Eddie's still getting worked up on Chavo. They've probably been doing this for the last 40 years. So Chavo then says, okay, listen, how about mom just gets a little color? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's Eddie just great. looks at him and goes, guys, stop. Please stop. Please stop. <laughs> it was That's great. Awesome. That's awesome. He was, he was, he was good. He was, he got him. <laughs> oh, it was so much fun. And I'm sitting there and going, Eddie, he's trying to work you up. Don't bite, don't bite on it. Eddie. Don't bite on it. Eddie knows he's trying to work him up. It's his older brother, but because it's his older brother, he's still getting worked up. And I'm going, Oh my goodness. I'm about to have a Guerrero fight here in the dress room. What, what in the world do I do now? Enjoy the hell out of it. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. No, Eddie, Eddie was special from the moment that he got, you know, when, when, when he got, he got, re- you guys don't know this, but he got really sick with meningitis. Oh, what was he about? First or second grade or third grade? He must have been about what, seven or eight. Uh-huh. And uh, we went to see, I would go see him at the hospital. He got really sick, really. They weren't expecting him to go to, you know, my mom prayed, a lot of prayed. She told me that she asked the Lord to leave him. You know what I mean? Yeah. If she would. And so uh, at that time I was, I was in, I was in high school and I would, I would ride. I had him a little. <laughs> I had a little Honda Honda ninety. I used to drive on on the freeway. <laughs> I don't know how I ever got rid. Never got nothing happened to me. But uh, we would go see him at the thing, and he he got he got he got really 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 sick. But after that, he really got better. And then uh, there was beautiful things about him that that just just always always great. Then he got it. He got into football. And he, he started playing little league football, and he did really good in football. The the guys that that were coaches, they say, yeah. I said Eddie, he says he don't need nobody to block him. He, he makes his own holes. Oh, wow! <laughs> is, that, is that when Eddie first started being the athlete that he, he became? I mean, when it was little yeah. league football. Yeah, yeah. The, some of the guys that were I knew that were you know that were coaching and stuff like that. Yeah, they told me. He said, "Your little brother, man. Your little brother could kick some ass, man." <laughs> He did pretty good. I always good told people, Chavo, that wrestling Eddie, it's inexplicable to somebody who hasn't been in the ring with somebody who's that great because you can't explain to people how good he was. He was like a live wire that was not grounded. When he mm-hmm. came out, there was just electricity. And, oh, and yeah. you, you know, you'd sit in the back and Eddie would, I'm not sure, you know, he, he, he didn't want to talk over a match in the back. But when he got out there, it was just magical. I remember one time I was, I'm in the ring, it's on a pay per view. And he calls, he goes, backdrop me on the table. We're in the ring. And I thought, what in the world is he talking about? Sure enough, he does something, does a flip. I can take a bump out of the ring, and all of a sudden, I'm right by the table. I go, I guess this is a spot. <laughs> I launch the backdrop and on the table. It was like it was like working with Houdini. It was just magical. I mean, it's like it was like uh, art. You know, it's like I'm sitting here, you know, with my hammer and tool, and he's sitting there with his creative little brush, just painting a beautiful picture. You know, it, it's just inexplicable to try to explain to people how good he was in the ring. I, I'd never been out there with anybody that was like Eddie. It's just it was magical. Yeah, yeah. I wrestled him too in WCW. I loved it. I loved every bit of it. And it was feel to him. You know, it was just yeah. feel. 
You know, of course, all, all you girls can, can work. You know, your your mother, your mother, when I when she had the heart attack, I'm sitting there looking you at her. Can work. Girl, this woman had a heart attack. Girl can work. Like, there's not a girl that can't work. <laughs> you guys can work too, man. You guys. Well, what well, what did you think when you saw that that clip of your mother there? Did you think it gone too far, or did you, what what did, no. what did, did, you, did you love um, it? You know what? It was a good thing. I was afraid that maybe she might have hurt herself when she fell on the ground. But then, no, uh, and then I saw oh, like oh, it, Lakefield, it, Lakefield pushed her to the ground. No, 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 no. What happened? Yeah. What happened? <laughs> no, 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 no. That was taken care of. Uh, Eddie made sure, and Chavo made sure, and Chavo made sure it's taken care of. I put my hand on her shoulder like I was, you know, pushing her, but she grabbed my wrist. That way, right. she could, she could take a, her her own bump down. So the whole time down, I'm I'm holding her, you know, going down to make sure that exactly. she was That's okay. Because right. last thing I'm going to do is hurt Mrs. Guerrero. <laughs> and El Paso, too, too many Guerrero. Yeah, in El Paso, <laughs> and you got fifty Guerrero brothers. You got to fight. <laughs> oh, right. You wouldn't have made it out alive. Is that the oh, night no. you got the? Is that the night you got the police escort out out of town? All the way out of town. They literally, when I, by the time I got the back, they had extra state troopers around the ring because they knew how bad it was going to get, and it got bad. I mean, Eddie was on the ground going, "Essay, get out of here." get out of here now. I mean, it was, it was hairy, but I knew I had to get it, you know, for the cameras. So I'm staying there as long as I can, you know, yelling at the people and all this stuff. Security's going, John, you got to get out of here. I got to the back and they had the car. My bag was in the trunk. They had my car ready. Literally, I got in my, with my wrestling trunks and boots and they gave me a police escort all the way to the city limit of El Paso. And they pulled over and the police did and said, Hey, we don't come back. We cannot guarantee your safety. So oh, wow. you could get killed by one of these fans. And so I drove all the way to Odessa uh, to fly out the next day to, to go to the, to the next town. Everybody else flew out of El Paso. They, but the police told me to leave town and not come back. <laughs> wow. That's how that's how, how popular uh, your mother and father were. And Eddie, uh, the whole Greer family was in, in El Paso. Yeah, that's a, it's kind of like, yeah. And the old man started it. It was, hey, we cannot take it away from Gory. Because he is the he was the mastermind, and he's the one that did, and he was the one that had the genes. <laughs> yeah. What what kind of partnership did he have with the Fox? I know that Fox. Great. Uh, you know, I this is what I understand. At first, when do you remember a, a promoter by the name of Doc Serpolis? Yes, I sure do. Yeah. So my dad told me that he went to the NWA during that time. That Doc Serpolis, I think, had uh, Amarillo. Am I right? Right. Right. Okay. Right. So and I had that I think I heard that my him and Dory had a little bit of a confrontation, but I don't know how it happened. I'm talking about Dory Senior. Dory Senior, yeah. Dory Senior. So later on, somebody calls my dad from the El Paso Coliseum and says, "Where, where, hey, where, 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 I might have this wrong. I, I very well could, but, but for what I remember, Dory was trying to work something out with the Romero family." Is that true, or do you remember that? No, I don't remember that. But he, he you know, that, yeah, Ricky came to El Paso a lot, and he was very popular in, in, in El Paso. You remember that? Uh, I don't know about the Romero family right now, but I do remember. I, I'm telling you uh, how it started, how my dad started with Dory, and how right. the. Do you want to hear that or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they were out out in Vegas, and there was some friction there. Yeah, so they had a they had a confrontation there. They're not a very good one. So then Dory Sr. calls the El Paso Coliseum. So my dad found out because they called my dad because my dad was already trying to start opening wrestling in the Coliseum. And my dad had had in nine be years before had wrestling in 62 and 63 and they used to book the judging arena and do TVs out of judging arena and then book the Tuesday nights on uh on uh no yeah tuesday nights in el paso this is back in 1962 so then my father my father has to go work again because uh somebody screwed him it's one of his partners here in el paso was trying to try to edge him out so my dad went to work and went to work for crockett as a wrestler and then came back in the 66 67 and started up again so when he started up again, we were all helping him, man. We, I, we, I was a guy that used to put up his posters and all that. Later on, I drove you around, Gerald, to pick you up, remember? <laughs> so, you know, so, okay. So the situation that happened there, 
that with Dory, he called and he was trying to get the old Pastor Carlos here. My dad called and started calling and getting, I don't know what arena, but he called the arena in Amarillo. So all of a sudden, Dory Sr. calls, hey, what you trying to do? <laughs> and my dad says, hey, says, you don't want me coming in? He says, El Paso's mine. Stay out of it. So they hung up. So I don't know how it happened. And the peace was made. I believe it's in one of the NWA. And the peace was made. And so my dad started working with the with Amarillo office. And that's how we started. That's and then that the, the, my dad and, and uh, Dory uh, Sr. became very close. Me, I used to go pick him up at the airport, right? And then he had a little girlfriend there. And then I used to go pick up and then blah, blah, blah. And then take him back to the airport, take the girlfriend back. <laughs> And then Dory, Dory Sr. would say, here, here's five bucks. He said, go drive, go, go buy you some beers. Don't tell your dad I told you. <laughs> <laughs> they have got one buy for you. Just gave me the money. <laughs> Gerald, I picked up your brother many times at the airport. Yeah, he Jack bought you, he bought you beer though, didn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Jack, Jack would come in. I'd go, I'd go pick him up. And they'd have him, they'd have him go sign autographs at uh, this, this place called uh, Leo's Appliances. And they would sell tickets there. And then we, I take him uh, to his hotel and do his thing. And then later on, I come and pick him up and take him to the uh, to the El Paso Coliseum, take him back and take him to the airports yeah. and take him out when, like, you know, like when, when you and I went out, remember? Yeah, yeah. We had, we had some fun. Oh, man, yeah. We had some really, and we, is that the night we got chased out of uh, Juarez? <laughs> <laughs> the Juarez was, it's, a, it's an animal of itself. <laughs> a lot of stuff there crazy stuff <laughs> so anything you want to tell us about Juarez there Mr. Briscoe I don't remember a whole lot <laughs> I, 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 I just remember one I night with, remember. With, Terry, with, with Terry Fox there was a steakhouse right there in Juarez where the guys used to go because it was cheap 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 steakhouse you know what I'm talking about there uh, Terry used to be Terry's favorite place to go we 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 went in there one night after the show. And there were a bunch of American businessmen sitting in there. One of them had ordered this one table to order a big big steak, and right before the steak comes, the guy gets up and he goes to the bathroom. Him and buddy go go to the bathroom. Probably take a hit of coke from from the looks of the guy. But <laughs> they got up and Terry Terry's hungry. And Terry Terry goes over. He sits down at the guy's plate and starts cutting him up the steak. Starts eating the guy's steak. Here they come out. They're juiced up, man. They're, 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 they're you can tell by their face, they're bright red. They, they were ready, ready to go. And so Terry stands up, starts reading the ride, actually forced the guys back down when they realized that, that you know, there's more, there's more with Terry and me, me and I think Scott Casey might have been there. But man, the next thing we know, here come the cops and the cops chase us out of the steakhouse. house. Terry had a, Terry had already paid for his steak and he didn't get to eat it. Now he's pissed off. So then we go to the cantina next door to the steakhouse, and there's the, the proverbial donkey in there, <laughs> and uh, and so Terry starts making fun. We get kicked out of there. We get we get Terry's car. We start across back across the border. We're getting chased out out of Mexico. We get there that 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 hotel El Camino or whatever the name of it was. The hotel had that had that big old parking lot in the back. Terry, Terry, Terry's driver. So we got, we start going around. Terry passes out behind the wheel. Now I'm scared to death. I'm trying to grab the wheel. Now Terry's foot is stuck on the gas. I'm trying to pull the gas. Guy, I foot off the gas. I'm trying to turn off the, uh, turn off the ignition. I'm trying, trying to straighten the, straighten the damn car up. All of a sudden, Terry straightens up, knocks me for a loop. Now he's trying to open the door while we're spinning and, and donuts around there. Finally, I pulled Terry off to the side there, get him off the side. I think with the help of Casey, get him off, and I get to get the car, get his foot off the gas pedal, finally, and I get the car where I can put it, and we can turn the damn thing off. But I thought that night that we were going to get killed, and sure enough, here comes the cops again. Now I've got the American cops after us. So they say, you recognize Terry and me. All right, guys, you're at the hotel. Go to your room right now. We won't get arrested. Don't come out of your room until in the morning when you're leaving town. And you could, we'll let you leave town. So uh, that that's my Terry Funk story of, of border <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Yeah, we had some time there, though, man. Well, what a what a town El Paso was back in those days, though. Well, I'm so, sorry. 
Watertown, are, Watertown, El Paso was back in those days, man. For, yes, no, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I went there uh, for my mom's, you know, for my mom's uh, funeral. So, yeah, so it's 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 still there. And the and the food is great. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. The food is it's it's yeah. I can't even. I can't even find it anywhere in the United States. Because that was, was so, I'm always interested in the background of what happened with the WWE and the gobbledygooker. Because from what I heard, Vince was planning on this being like the mascot for the WWE is what I heard. So I, let me ask you, what happened? Okay, well, I did the thing with, uh, you know, Vince called me in. He asked me to do the thing with the WWE, with the, with the uh, you know, it was WWF then. Yeah, and, uh, and, the, and the gobbledygooker, and uh, I, I enjoyed that it was going to do. But you know what? He, they did it at the Meadowlands, right? So you know what kind of a crowd Meadowlands is? It's oh, like it's yeah. like it's horrible. They could, they could right? be like Philly fans. I mean, they they yeah, they'll, they'll boo exactly. The, they'd boo Moses. I know, right? <laughs> so so I didn't I didn't know I never wrestled at the Meadowlands, so I didn't know what to tell him. I said, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, at first, with all due respect to Pat Patterson, because he's already gone, rest in peace, he didn't treat me right. So I, I didn't, I never paid attention to when they started trying to call me for the gobbledygooker, because he had cussed me out. He told me, don't ever call this office again, because I wanted to see if I could get some work with WWF. So I said, okay. So they, I had a lot of calls, like about four or five, and I had my first wife then. And she says, hey, man, it's WWF. They say they want to talk to you. I said, well, I don't want to talk to them. Hang up on them. So I did that for about, I don't know, three or four times. Finally, I picked up the phone one time, and it says, is this Hector Guerrero? I go, yeah. Hey, don't, 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 don't hang up. Vince wants to talk to you. So then I talked with Vince, and he said, you know, I want to do something. But then he turns me over to Pat Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know, you know, but I, I went ahead and did it. And... It, the whole thing worked out great. I think. How did they propose it to you? What they what they what they sell you on? Well, Vince said that you know they wanted to do something for the kids, and I and I'm you know I don't you know you you know what I teach? I teach elementary. My I love my kindergartners and first graders. I have fifth graders too, you know, but I don't like them. They think they know. <laughs> they're, but you know, my first and second graders, man, they're all love. So. Uh, I I I I used to uh, when when I wrestled in Mexico as as Lasertron, we called them the defender of the the children, and when we did it with Dusty Rhodes Lasertron, Lasertron was for the children. We did something in 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 uh, Charlotte about that. So when the gobbledygooker was proposed to it, he says, you know, I want to do something for the kids. I go, yeah, let's do it. So okay, so I did it. Okay, I never. Okay, so they booed it. Boom, boom, boom. Then we did it for about three months later. You know, he did it around the towns. And then I, uh, I saw myself uh, when we went to uh, West Palm Beach. I saw myself I wasn't booked anymore. So it kind of dropped my heart, you know. So then uh, uh, I didn't hear nothing. I went home and I didn't hear nothing for eight, nine months. You know, nothing. So I had to get a job. And you weren't, or you weren't at that time. WWE guys weren't on contract. You were just on an independent contractor work yeah, and get paid, right? I, yeah, but when, like, when I first started, when I first agreed, I started getting a thousand dollars a week from Vince. I appreciated it that because that really helped me out a lot. And then when the whole thing went, I just got, like dropped the ball. So then. I went and I, I, I got, you know what I did? I became a, a waiter in a Mexican restaurant. And then after that, after that stint, I, 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 I tried to get booked. And so I got booked in Puerto Rico the first time. Okay. So I wanted to get booked in Puerto Rico the first time and, and, uh, and came back and, you know, made, made some decent money. Yeah, when, when you got when you got booked down in Puerto Rico, did that gimmick follow you around? Did that gimmick follow you down there? I mean, were no, you? No, sir. Nobody knew about that. I was a gobbledygooker down there. And then, but when I was in Puerto Rico. They 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 started calling me because it was it was the next uh, Survivor Series. But I was in Puerto Rico, and when I got back, is it, they were saying, "Are is this a joke? We've been trying to call you, and this and that." I go, "Well, I haven't been in town. Been trying to make a living." Mm -hmm. You know, not booked. So 
So, uh, you know, they said, well, well, we'll call you back. And so then they call me, they say, why don't you turn, you know, can you, can you send the uniform? I go, yeah, is that what you want? And they said, yeah, that's how it happened. Not that I left it, that, no. What happened was, is I was out there trying to, trying to work and uh, back then, telephones were different than they are now. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, and then, it took you days or weeks to get hold of people back then. Yeah. And so when I got back, my, my ex had been, they said, I've been trying to get a hold of you. He says, I'm glad you called. He says, because w, uh, WF has called. I says, okay, well, so I'll try to call. So then that's what they told me. Well, we'll call you back. And then they call me back. He says, you know what? Can you turn it in? I go, yeah, I don't mind. You know, I was upset. I got treated like the shits again. And so I said, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Brad. I didn't realize it's such a, you know, I, I just said, always heard that Vince wanted it to be like a mascot and he thought the thing would take off like crazy. Is what yeah. And, and he, and he had it right. It was right, John. And, and it was right for the kids, but it was at the wrong place. And I didn't know. Right. Now, when we did it that time, we were after a month or two where we were doing it still, we went to, we went to Orlando and it was great. The kids went wild and crazy, but look where we were, man. Sure. We were in Disneyland. We were in Universal Studios. You know, we're you know WWE, WWF is coming in. It went over like gangbusters. Yes, but that was that's maybe it should have been done there, not right. uh, not the metal line. But that that was I don't know. I mean, I don't know whose whose decision that was at that time. You know, I know the idea was for Vince's idea. This is what I had learned. And then, but he wasn't wrong, and I'm not kissing his ass or anything. I'm just telling you the truth. It, it was a good idea, just at the wrong place, in the wrong, wrong place, just the wrong place. Right. Yeah. Been in places in like Philadelphia, you know, they would they boo Hogan in his heyday. I mean, oh, they, yeah. They loved, they loved to boo <laughs> what they were supposed to cheer. You know? Yes. But the, 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 the ironic thing about it, you know, that character that that you know that got over at the time and was just kind of dropped and everything now it's turned out to be one of the most iconic uh that's right characters of that's all right. time that's what's really oh, so that's cool about it to me that's awesome but you know because you, you came back in the legends uh battle royal right yeah yeah that's right. and, and, and the and the gobbledygooker got one of the biggest cheers <laughs> <laughs> it was great you know what they had the they had the the, the the it wasn't it was they didn't when they made the first goblin gooker the the mask went over my head and it, i could actually it was over made to my face and then they had these white balls like this that were made out of plastic but you know i didn't realize but i'll tell you a story later that when they shine those white ball white lights <laughs> all you could see is white wow. but anyway that that that's that's the way that that was and that when they better Demon guy Battle Royal, they told out, uh, do you remember the gentleman that that had to do all the the I'm trying to remember he he worked for it. He's not there anymore. Uh he he told me, uh, Hector, we couldn't find your elder, so we had to make one up. And so they gave me a helmet. And then it had a strap underneath. So when uh Tugboat picked me up to throw me out of the battle royal, I mean I was holding onto the helmet, man, because it was <laughs> And I'm telling you, Tubbo, he says, what? He says, let me parade you around, around the ring around. I says, okay. He says, but do it quick because I'm about to lose this helmet. <laughs> <laughs> so well, Hector, hey, th thanks so much. I know you got to teach school. And so uh, there's there's so much more in your career, but, uh, you know, it, we, maybe we can do a part two. But I, I want to tell you that uh, your, your brother, Eddie, it just meant the world to me. And your brother, Eddie and Chavo, they made my whole career that, that, that angle they gave me with, with your mother made my whole career. And, and without that, I wouldn't have been in the hall of fame. Wouldn't have been any of that without wrestling Eddie. I'd have never been, I always say JBL owes everything to Eddie Guerrero. And I don't say that uh, gratuitously. I say that as legit hundred percent truth. I owe everything to Eddie Guerrero. And I think so much of Eddie as a person, we were really good friends. You know, he's a groomsman at my wedding, and I got to speak at his funeral. And yes. I remember being backstage with you and your brothers, and I don't remember which, if it was you or Mondo or, or Chavo told me. He said, T today you're a Guerrero. And uh -huh. I'm, I'm almost about to tear up because 
till the day I die, that's one of the nicest things ever said to me. I just, that, that has a special place in my heart and uh, the Guerrero family has a special place in my heart and you have a special place in my heart. And thank, thank you. you so, thank you so much for, for, for coming on. It's wonderful to see you again, Hector. Man thank with whom? The man with womb. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke he used to always tell me when you're working for crying. He drove me crazy. <laughs> yeah. Heck, Hector, Hector, I know you I've seen you on a couple of shows there. I mean, uh, where where can folks get ahead a hold of you if they want to book you for a for a, a merchandising show or a card show? How can they get a hold of you? I got a I got a website. It's called uh hectorwrestlingguerrero.com. I, look, I looked at it before the show. It's really good. I really enjoyed it. I yes. enjoyed reading the stuff, reading the stuff about you, and it was it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you know what? I enjoyed doing the Gobbly Grooker the times that I did. So maybe the royalties will come in, huh? Maybe. That's right. That's right. It. That's <laughs> right. Well, it's getting Gobbly Grooker time, so maybe you never know what will happen, you know. <laughs> That's ready, right. ready for the ready for the thing, right? All right, man. <laughs> That's right.